Hey everyone, uh, my name is Eve. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Fieldwire. We're a construction startup based in San Francisco, and I wanted to welcome uh, all of you who are attending this uh, virtual town hall. Uh, like many of our guests today, uh, I'm quarantining in my home, uh, and as we're entering a week, I think our third or fourth week of quarantine, or at the very least, reduced economic activity, I think it's time to ask a few questions. Uh, as we're seeing, essential activities are continuing in many sectors, construction being one of them. How essential really is it uh, to keep construction running right now? And so I think we're gonna we're going to highlight very specific activities where construction contractors uh, and construction related entities are uh, able to contribute directly to solving the crisis. Then we're going to talk about safety and the economics of uh, keeping sites running uh, in this situation. Uh, and finally, we're going to turn our attention towards the recovery phase. I think the current situation is expected to last for a while. And even if a strict shelter in place ends, we're not going to be back uh, at 100% immediately. And so we need to learn to operate durably in an environment that's not going to be safe for a long time. Uh, so we've gathered a group of panelists uh, to represent different parts of the country, uh, as well as different types of organization and construction markets. And I'm now going to introduce uh, uh, you to our panelists. So going east to west, uh, we have uh, Tim, Tim Croak, who's a VP at Tishman in New York City. Uh, he's worked on, on projects such as the, the Cornell New York campus, uh, NYU Hospital, uh, or recently the famous Waldorf Astoria Rebuild. Welcome, Tim. Thank you. And uh, we have uh, Tyler Bachelor, who's the owner of SBS Strategic Building Services uh, in California. They are, an ins they are the inspector of record on many ongoing healthcare facilities, such as the Loma Linda Hospital in SoCal. Welcome, Tyler. Thank you. Glad to be here. And uh, we have uh, Nathan, Nathan Howat, uh, who's the, the president of Blue Mountain Electric. They're an electrical contractor in Washington state, focusing primarily on uh, federal projects such as Navy and Coast Guard uh, projects. So Nathan is bringing, I think, a point of view of a different type of essential work. Uh, and so welcome, Nathan. Thank you. So let's not waste time. Uh, we're going to dive right in. Uh, once again, this discussion is going to be in two parts. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the first part, uh, I have questions that I've prepared for our guests. Uh, and then in the second part, we're going to uh, answer audience questions. So we have Justin in the background that's collecting questions on chat. So submit your question there, and she's going to compile them so that we can cover them in the second part. All right, let's get in. Uh, so construction, as we said, has been deemed essential, uh, like an essential business activity in many parts of the country. Uh, and therefore, it's continuing to operate mostly. I think most of our guests are still operating actively right now uh, with their business. But how do you define essential at a time where we have the Navy moving hospital ships in large metro areas or the Army building campaign hospitals? So as we're going to see, uh, many contractors are actually finding themselves on the front line as well. So maybe we can start uh, with you, Tim. I mean, you, you just rolled off uh, the Waldorf Astoria, and my understanding is that you're actually involved in, in very fast healthcare transformation projects right now in New York City. Sure, those are probably the pretty straightforward ones. The the essential are the hospitals, the uh, life care centers, things like that. Uh, they've also got utilities and infrastructure still going and even, even regular buildings that have life safety issues, sort of uh, local law 11, which is facade repairs, um, on buildings, things like that, that might be a threat to the public or to the safety of the building itself structurally. Those are ongoing. Um, also, more immediately in the last uh, month or so, that we've got the temporary hospitals, um, Army Corps of Engineers, with some of those, but there's also some private sector work that we're doing on, on different college campuses, such as Westbury Building Temporary Hospital, temporary facilities, and also, um, fitting out existing spaces in existing hospitals for more intensive care, more uh, turn them into an intensive care unit, adding medical gases, more power uh, to aid ventilators and oxygen, things like that. So maybe uh, explain to us a little bit more what it means to kind of like upgrade, I think, medical care facilities to uh, to be able to, uh, to treat patients? So you're saying it's mostly increasing the electrical output, but are there other factors? Well, there's a lot more equipment involved. There's a lot more supervision from the nursing and, and doctor staffs. So where you may have a room with a, a coherent patient, which is coming in and they may be there overnight or for a couple of days, 
but they're coherent, they're speaking, and they're they're being monitored with basic equipment. Somebody that uh, may be not uh, or not conscious or semi-conscious has a lot more instrumentation, a lot more telemetry that's monitoring their their functions, monitoring their status. Um, there's more uh, cameras maybe watching the patient, monitoring the equipment uh, activity. There's gases if this person's on oxygen 24 hours a day. Uh, there's suction for different functions in the hospital. There's um, air flow. So those gases have to come to the, to the space and they're not in all spaces, um, typically in a head wall or sometimes we're fitting them without a real head wall, but they're, they're in there for hooking up to equipment such as ventilators that everybody's hearing about. So it demands more power. There's more power requirements. It's all emergency power. So it, if something happens to the hospital, that, that equipment stays on. It's all life uh, functioning, life safety equipment. So there is power requirements, there's IT requirements. There's um, different sort of the plumbing, which is the gases, have mm -hmm. to be brought to the, that space. That's, I mean, those are obviously, I think, accelerated timelines on those projects. What, how fast can we actually like upgrade a section, let's say, of a hospital from the moment where they decide to do it to like completing the design, completing the, you know, the retrofit of, 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 of I don't know, the, the few rooms of a hospital and just delivering it back? What are you seeing out there? Well, we're seeing, you know, a couple of weeks to a month, um, depending on what has to be done, what walls, if there's the, the, the less um, intrusive it is, if we don't have to tear down walls, rip up floors, things like that, it goes much quicker. And it depends on the availability of the materials. Sometimes the medical valves or medical boxes aren't immediately available off the shelf. Most of the distribution is wires, conduit, that you can get pretty quickly. Uh, ceiling tiles, things like that. In the rooms, they're built a little different from the hallway. So you try, when we go in there, not to disrupt, uh, tear up the ceilings and the walls as much, just uh, surface mount it for immediate use. You know, it's not pretty so much, but it's functional. Okay, that makes that makes a ton of sense. Um, Tyler, uh, we, were, we were talking uh, briefly about this. I think Los Angeles is turning the Staples Center into a temporary uh, uh, medical facility, like, uh, You've been exposed a little bit to that project. Can you tell us more about it? Sure. Um, we, we as inspector of records aren't dealing with, with that, but OSHPOD, who is Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development, that's the jurisdiction that we work under out here in California. They um, have been um, deployed to go and look at that. And really that's a kind of a joint review between OSHPOD and CDPH. So that's licensing the Department of Public Health. And um, some of the items that they're looking for is really just the, of course, life safety aspects, uh, ingress, egress, their communications, what type of water systems do they have there? Of course, electrical, medical, gas. A lot of times they're, you know, um, bringing in the, the E cylinders or H cylinders, depending on the size and how they're feeding uh, the, the potential patients. So um, they have converted that. Oshpod has provided. Um, some guidelines that's good for them. And that would also work for licensing. Um, a lot of that is spacing between uh, patient beds, of course, and um, of course your essential services, which um, we deal with a lot. Okay. Um, and I think you guys are, are very aware on, on the evolution of codes right now. Are you seeing codes being adjusted right now to deliver medical facilities faster or to actually cover that type of temporary medical facilities? Um, so uh, one good thing is, is OSHPOD has um, policy intent notices. They also have um, what they call pins and they have code application notices as well. Um, those are cans. Uh, we do have a pin it's called pin four and pin four is kind of integrated and in with um, what I've, I've received from different OSHPOD officials. Um, they've sent out, and really that was for TB patients, but this is in kind of the same regard um, based on now with the more, um, you know, ever-evolving um, information that we're getting from the CDC and um, 
we're we're seeing that it is more of airborne, not just surface. And so pin four was really to create um, negative isolation brooms. So they have something in place for that. Um, really, the best thing to do is to reach out to the jurisdiction, let them know that hey, we're converting our spaces, we're taking our operating rooms, which we have low censuses now because we're trying to keep only whatever is necessary to have operated and people operated on, no elective operations going on. So they're converting and repurposing those spaces to make them into negative isolation rooms just as a proactive yeah. approach of getting these patients um, in there and, and cared for. Are you uh, are you actually seeing like a, uh, an increased activity for your team right now with the the amount of retrofitting that's going on in the in the healthcare industry? Oh, absolutely. Um, I think just me personally, and I have about 35 inspectors that work for me, and um, we have about 10 support staff that that maintain all our documentation from day to day. Um, but we're very busy with this. Um, I have daily conference calls. Um, um, with different facilities. They're putting out a lot of great information, a lot of helpful information. They're giving us um, links to different websites. We have our own protocols on, on what we're doing as a company, but um, it, it is definitely a lot of time and energy that we're spending on this, um, but it's, it's very much needed. And it's kind of like Tim was mentioning with the temporary facilities, we have tents going on outside. Uh, we have prototypes being made and, and constructed off site for approval for different facilities. So um, there's just a lot of collaboration with the facilities and designers and contractors to, uh, you know, create these additional spaces that, you know, we, we may not have um, for all these potential patients that could come in. Yeah, it's a very difficult balance of uh, maintaining standards uh, as we're trying to bring capacity online as fast as possible. Uh, that makes a, a ton of sense. Talking about a different kind of essential facility, I see Nathan working primarily with the Navy and the Coast Guard. Uh, you were saying that uh, that you got letters from from uh, from uh, Navy officers to make sure that you guys would keep coming on site. What's the situation uh, up in Washington State? Yeah, here in the Pacific Northwest, uh, Naval Installations and Coast Guard, um, they're we're moving forward with almost all of our. Um, projects every single one of our projects so far is moving forward uh, we haven't had um we haven't stopped any of them we're, we're moving forward with critical infrastructure projects for um base electrical distribution uh, i've got um, a generator getting loaded on a barge going on a four and a half hour boat ride on monday to a remote island with a aids the navigation station for the coast guard and they're very um, adamant that we keep moving forward with that um, to keep their infrastructure up and running um, Things like air traffic control, um, the nuclear submarine uh, fleet, and the and the uh, and pier work, things like that. We're we're full full tilt moving forward with all of that work. I mean, that's actually a, a great segue segue to the next question, which is uh, uh, let's talk safety for a second, right? Uh, and and keeping essential sites going is is important, but in a manner, I guess, that's safe for the crew. Uh, I think we all saw in the news last week that. Uh, the, the captain of a, of, a, of a nuclear aircraft carrier was fired for, I think, arguing for the safety of his crew over immediate combat readiness. Obviously, there's a lot of hard choices to make. So, Nathan, like, uh, how, how are you approaching that? I mean, like, you have a lot of, of, of craftsmen working for you. Uh, just how are you approaching safety? How are the, the, the craftsmen and women on your team feeling about the situation? Yeah, we've got about 20 uh, craft professionals, um, licensed electricians, um, journeymen and apprentices, and um, you know all different ages, uh, health conditions, things like this. Obviously, this has uh, totally changed uh, so many aspects of what we're doing. So um, first, our, our first and foremost um, care is for their health and safety. Um, and and uh, even though we have, um, you know, deadlines and things that need to get done um there's health and safety is our number one priority so first of all um, we made sure that it was clear that if they felt like they needed to go home um, for their own safety um, or the safety of someone at home um, that they could bring something back to that they had they were given the opportunity to do that want to make sure that they don't feel like they're going to be punished for doing that because it's that's our number one priority and then and then for everyone else we just ask them to please come to work and um 
they're doing it uh, for the most part. Uh, just about everyone is here. There's a couple people that that absolutely had to to leave, and we totally supported them doing that. And everyone else has stepped up to fill the gap, and they're working overtime and they're working hard to to fill in the gap for them. So we're really proud of um, of the work they're doing. Um, as far as safety is concerned, we're we're now uh, as of last night uh, on DoD property, we're required to wear masks, cloth coverings. Um, so we've, we're starting to implement that. It's challenging because um, they don't exist. And um, so my wife's home making some right now. And um, so we'll see how that goes. Um, I'm sure they'll be great. And then uh, all, we're putting in policies like no no employees, no more than one employee driving a company vehicle at a time. Um, job trailers and, and lay down areas are definitely areas of concern with people gathering together, being on the job, being six feet apart. Um, we've restricted access to our office and other areas, the warehouse areas where we have to be. So we're just trying to do the best we can to uh, keep working and supporting the mission, but um, stay safe and let someone, you know, we, we would not want anyone to, to get sick at work and go home and have a problem. That would be devastating. That, that makes sense. I think we want to keep the crew safe as much as possible. Uh, Tyler, you're involved on some really large headcount projects. I mean, like that's typical of healthcare facilities. Uh, what are what are some of the steps you've seen uh, that are being taken in Southern California to uh, to make sure are those sites operating at at reduced crew size or are they I don't know like uh, just temperature uh, metering at the entrance of the site? What what are you seeing? Yeah, so we're we're working on Loma Linda. Um, uh, medical center and that's a uh, a million square foot hospital new construction um you know we have uh you know we we did have around a little over 800 workers on site every day um we kind of kept that man count around 700 just north of 700 and um it's it's a big task um mccarthy construction is is the builders on the job and um we've really got a lot of skeleton crew um in our in our office area, MBBJ is our architect. Um, they are, you know, one or two people. So we're scaling that down. We're taking every precaution we can. Um, when I talked earlier about having a, a daily meeting, that's what we're doing with that job specifically. So they're taking a lot of, um, you know, precautionary actions to try to, you know, for one, make sure that everybody feels safe and they have a good working environment, but also um, two, to keep the project going. We're looking to get occupancy of the building at the end of this year. Um, so we're considering this something very critical um, for the community and um, to get this space open, it will be very important for them. So um, they have, uh, you know, since implemented uh, cleaning for our areas, making sure our, our surfaces are very clean. Um, we've got, they've hired that cleaning service to go from one side of the trailer to the other. They're doing it in the field as well. Um, they're providing masks. They're the general contractors, not only providing masks for, um, the facility of Loma Linda, the existing hospital, but also for our construction site. So that's mm. been very helpful. We're keeping that six foot distance. It's, it's very hard to do, but it's very important to do. Um, and, and then really it's just, you know, what if somebody gets um, or tests positive? And so if we have um, people that are testing positive, then we are, you know, uh, we have a protocol for that. We're um, making sure that they get their treatment. We're identifying where they've been working. Uh, they're cleaning those areas as necessary. And they're um, also, um, you know, identifying who they've been around. So keeping track of you know who they're interacting with and the cdc has um, laid out some specific requirements for that and that's if you if you come within six feet and you're with that person for more than five minutes within that range then they're considering that person to self-quarantine and that's a 14-day quarantine and that's what they're doing um yep. so you know luckily we're just you know uh, maintaining that keeping that clear distance and and trying to move the project forward for the community I mean, I'm not an expert, but it seems to be a game of statistics and every little thing that you can do counts in terms of uh, reducing the chance of exposure of your crews. Uh, Tim, in in New York City, as, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you're operating on uh, active facilities uh, when you're doing those those retrofits. Are there any specificities to that or what, what have you seen on in terms of measures taken? Well, what we've done, uh, first of all, is just, just try to educate the workers and everybody on the staff as to what the threat is. Um, 
so they understand how they can keep themselves safe. And then we've taken, there is uh, New York City DOB uh, standards, there's OSHA standards, and we've formalized a protocol of uh, how everybody should be working on the site with each other, whether they're within six feet, how long they're working, what uh, activities they're doing. So they feel like it's being addressed. It's not just, okay, just do this. It's a formal protocol. So they understand that it's been looked at, that it's a, it's a way to keep them safe and they feel a little bit better about working. There are a lot of, it's tough getting a lot of workers right now. A lot of them don't want to come to the job sites. So when we go to the hospitals, uh, which are active hospitals, <laughs> the first question in some of these hospitals, uh, some of these hospitals are, are pretty active with the coronavirus more mm -hmm. so than others. Yeah. Um, and the first question they say is, well, you know, how do we go there with all that going on? And typically the hospitals themselves, they, this is what they do. They know how to handle it. And they're in conjunction with some of the other facility uh, city um, agencies like the FDNY and the police. And they've set up uh, screening areas at the emergency rooms where people come in, they get pre-screened to see if they really have the coronavirus or something else, what they need to do. So they kind of isolate the people that probably have corona in a, in a side area. So it's just not one big gathering at the main entrance. Typically, we go in either a main entrance or through the loading dock. And from the loading dock, it's typically isolated to where we're going. Uh, the hospitals themselves or we will clean down and disinfect the areas um, that people are occupying on a, on a constant basis. The hospital disinfects their areas, obviously. Uh, there's signage to direct so nobody wanders off into an occupied area. And typically in hospitals, you can't really wander off into an occupied area without somebody noticing you. Um, where we're retrofitting is is usually an isolated wing, so it's it's emptied out. So we go through a you know, set of, there's usually two doors followed by two doors, an isolation area, and we're into the area. And then we isolate it like a typical construction site, probably a little bit more so. And, you know, we carry on from there. So the construction group is isolated. Um, so coming from their cars into the actual site, the work area, um, it's usually not as big a threat as they would think. Uh, the hospital takes care of it. We make sure of the pathways that they are supposed to take. So again, we, we mitigate the, the dangers involved with it. Okay. I mean, those are, those are, those are excellent steps. Uh, I, I want to react to something you said, which is, um, it may be hard uh, to convince workers to come work on those essential facilities, as as you said, they they, they may seem like closer to an epicenter of, of COVID-19. Um, the biggest argument, I think, for keeping sites running uh, is that it also uh, makes sure that that the workers and the craftsmen are 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 getting their paychecks. Um, this situation, I mean, and and sometimes it feels like that might. That might not necessarily be the case if if there is a fear that the site is being exposed uh, to to coronavirus. Uh, we we can expect this situation to last for a while, um, and and I want to talk about more about the long term and the recovery. Uh, I was reading an article today that was saying that this is not really going to be over until we have a vaccine or or like a successful treatment, and that's not going to happen for the next 12, 18 months. And so that seems like an extremely long period of time. So how are you guys planning uh, for, for, for the long term? Uh, so Nathan, maybe we can start with you as a specialty contractor. You're probably the most exposed uh, to, to various variations in activities. So how are you thinking about this? Yeah, honestly, not much has changed for us. We're still bidding work and, and designing work and doing work. So um, as, as long as the, the Navy's open for business and letting us in to do the work, we're gonna keep doing it. and, and uh, um, you know, obviously, if there's a major um, infection that goes through and people have to quarantine and we can't supply guys with manpower, things like that, um, if that happens with our crew, I fully anticipate that's going to happen with all the other trades and the general contractor and everyone else. So that project might be shut down when that happens. Um, if it happens, I hope it doesn't, but um, I don't see how it how it couldn't in some regards, um, just because. Um, you know, of all the, all it's so much going around. So um, we're just going to keep doing what we're doing, taking it day by day, and and um, 
we'll make the best decisions we can as we as we need to make them. Yeah. So what you're saying is that you've seen no changes to the procurement process on 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 government jobs right now. Like they're they're essentially open for business and and just continuing the the process. Right? I think I think it's a little slower because people are working from home and they don't they're not collaborating as much to get you know project managers talking to contracting officers and things like that. So um, you know right now there hasn't been a, we're still seeing some jobs coming out to bid and some other and the pipeline still getting loaded. Um, but it's you know we're we're just hoping that that continues if um, until it, until it doesn't and then we'll, we'll tackle that when it comes. I mean usually the 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 stimulus package usually comes from the from the government on on right. on government infrastructure. So I think uh, yeah. that there is hope on that front. Right. Um, Tim, like uh, you've you've uh, like Tishman is obviously involved on many types of projects. Are you seeing? The activities scale back on some of them to favor others. Uh, how are you adapting for the long term? Well, corporately, uh, it's, it's scaled back quite a bit. Um, they've scaled back at the main offices. They've scaled back on a lot of the job sites. They they had to some co close down completely. Some only certain operations are allowed to continue. So it's it's quite a bit of a scale back. Um, I mean, I'm more of an optimist. I don't think it's going to go on forever like some people do. I, I'm hoping that by the end of this month, uh, if everybody went and did the right things, hopefully by the end of this month, we'll, we'll see all the curves um, level off or start to uh, decrease. And certain other types of projects uh, that are non-essential now might open up to activity as, long, as well as a lot of other businesses out there. Um, along with the uh, the the actual construction sites you've got suppliers and vendors and factories that are shut down so we're seeing the supply chain affected as well trying to get those uh those items um and i think that might affect construction down the road a bit but hopefully in some of the projects we do that are say two three year projects sometimes more uh a, a two or three week blip can be made up and it can be absorbed. Um, a two or three month hit uh, can't necessarily be absorbed. So I'm hoping that this is sooner rather than later and, and we can all you know make up for that lost time and the people that are out of work will be eager to get back to work and, and make up you know their losses. Yeah, I mean, I would agree on, 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 on your timeline of like two to four weeks. I mean, we're seeing Europe starting to to bend the curve already, I think we're going to be there in the U.S. Uh, in in a, in a matter of weeks. And the hope is that if people can prove that that crew safety is taken very very seriously, as as you're saying, less essential projects will be able to reopen progressively, uh, and and go like that. Uh, Tyler, maybe a, a similar question for you. I mean, once again, you were saying that the activity was uh, extremely intense right now uh, on 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 healthcare facilities, but but how how are you seeing the the market evolve long term, uh, and how how is your team adjusting to the situation? Right. Um, no, we we do have some facilities who are really looking at what the, they consider a non-essential project, construction project, and what is essential for them um, to get certain spaces open, or if we've had ongoing construction, or if they want to take some of their projects and cancel. So we have seen some uh, projects that we had coming up um, that were postponed. Um, we have seen some of our facilities, um, you know, look to stop some of their projects that they've got. And, you know, that's a, a, a big concern for, you know, a lot of our, our people and, and working and continuing to work. So um, we've seen some facilities in uh, L.A. that aren't ours, um, but we had a new construction project just shut down their whole um, uh, project, which was a, a new tower addition to their existing campus. So um, we are seeing fluctuations in this. I think we do see a lot of people um, or, or facilities worried about their cash flow and if, if they're going to have, I mean, their census is down right now and they're worried mm -hmm. about their, whether they're going to be able to fund some of these jobs. So we see that. And, and so what we've looked at, some of the things that we've looked at, we've looked at, um, you know, kind of a deferred payment program for us. You know, whether that's, um, you know, continuing to work 
with a percentage that would be paid to you um, over the time frame of you know months. Um, so we look at that, and you know, of course, we're here to, to help the facilities and, and do what we can. So we're continuing to work. We're continuing to provide the services. Uh, we we don't want to stop that, and, and of course, we want to stay safe as well. But um, you, you will see some fluctuations in in the healthcare construction industry. Just just um, a little concerned about what the future holds. And uh, that makes sense. So we're actually at the halfway point of this discussion. So I want to remind the audience to submit their questions. I see that we have already a lot of questions that have been submitted, uh, which we're going to move uh, move to. Uh, Tyler, I think you, you, you bring a, a very good point, which is the, the, the question of payments, deferred payments, adjusting how we're either uh, invoicing services or, or, or collecting money. Uh, and, and I want to hear uh, from, uh, from Tim and Nathan what, what they're doing on, 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 on that front or maybe what they're doing differently on that front. Uh, so Tim, maybe you have some uh, some thoughts on 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 that on that front. Well, right now, I mean, uh, we're not we're continuing where we can. Uh, if if the job is operational, um, the office staff would be working out of remote locations or home offices. Uh, the supers are either on the site uh, or rotating in and out, handling what they need to handle. There's there's bids going on. There's uh, uh, bulletins out that are being priced. There's plenty of work to do in the, in the near term. Um, as far as jobs that are shut down completely, um, I'm, I'm not involved with anything that's completely shut down. But for a week or two, you would I wouldn't recommend, and, and I haven't seen that any jobs being completely demobilized. That that costs money, um, and mobilizing again costs money so unless it's going to be a long term you don't want to completely demobilize what we have done is move rental equipment off the site so we're not paying rental fees things like that there are electrical shutdowns mechanical shutdowns or standby that's required so we're covering those costs or you know the owners covering those costs for what's required to part do partial shutdowns just for safety reasons that may be mandated by DOT or just practical uh, standards to shut things down so there's not a, a flood or a leak or a fire or something mm -hmm. like that. So we, we've tried to cover the practical aspects of costs on the job, but certainly keeping the job going through remote locations and everything like that, it's still functioning, um, maybe at a less efficient manner for a while, but there's a lot of new technologies that people are getting used to too. And, and, and People have gotten pretty used to them pretty quickly over the last couple of weeks, and and that has ramped up efficiency too. So I don't know if it's 100%, but certainly people are functioning, and they know the importance. Uh, at least uh, we've talked to our staff, and I'm sure most people have, as the importance of keeping things going. So people are learning the technology and using it pretty quickly and making it more efficient, doing what they need to do. I, I want to I want to drill a little bit uh, further with you on that before uh, we go to Nathan. Um, there is, a, as you said, there is a minimum overhead to keeping a site open, safe, and running. Is there what is the the threshold of disruption in either productivity or the supply chain uh, that makes it so that it doesn't make sense to keep the site running? Uh, like where you're like we should we would rather shut down that site than just keep it running at a very low productivity or face major supply issues well it's it's first of all is the time you're going to shut down i mean what's practical to shut a job down again if you've got a job that's going on two three plus years and you're only shutting it down for a couple of weeks you can make up that time um working at additional hours additional people accelerating materials things like that if you've got a job that's shutting down for a month and then all of a sudden you're not getting mechanical equipment you're at a stage where you're um, installing, say, mechanical equipment or something like that, and you can't get that for another month. Um, it's different. So the thing about construction is every job is is different, and the mm -hmm. demand or requirements through the course of the schedule are very different. So it's got to really be a, a close look at where you're at on your individual project to what you do, whether you shut it down, whether you furlough people, whether you move people to other job sites that will be continuing or starting up, things like that. And those are all things 
that are have been and are being talked about probably on most jobs right now. Yep, that, that makes a ton of sense. Uh, maybe Nathan, and once again, like we were talking about invoicing and payments, I think the government can sometimes be the best or the worst customer, depending mm -hmm. on how you look at it. What mm -hmm. uh, have you seen any any changes there? We're st we're still getting paid. Um, we we are a subcontractor to private contractors, so I don't deal directly with the government in a, from a contractual perspective. But okay. um, we've had some we've had we've been receiving um, payments for. Um, accounts receivable and and you know still paying our bills and and uh, we we've, we've worked with our vendors to um, get um, extend our terms if possible to just to make sure that if there is a gap or a delay I think one of the things that concerns me a little bit is all the people working from home for the Navy that whether they have access to their systems for mm -hmm. approval and processing of invoices things like that and and whether that they're still going to be able to do that. Uh, I expect them to, since they're expecting us to keep working. I expect them to keep paying. So um, we'll hope that relationship continues and and um, and we can keep working. But it's been it hasn't been long enough to really know whether there's an impact on that yet, as far as the government um, processing payments for construction. But we, but we haven't we don't have any reason to believe that they won't. So okay, I mean that that makes sense, and I think that's that's good for the. Uh, for the business. So one one audience question was really uh, on, on the word essential. I mean, how did you initially feel about the use of the term essential when it was applied to the construction business? Uh, how do you feel about it now? Uh, and, you know, I, anybody wants to take that one first? I think I could I could start with that if you want. Um, I, you know, I think, um, you know, we're on the Internet. Um, you're in a house that has power. Um, so um, from an electrical electrician standpoint, um, we are vitally essential to, uh, right now, especially to make sure that the power grid remains operational, not just the power grid, but the whole system, all of the, the last mile to your house and, and um, internet and um, connectivity and things like that is, is one of the things that's keeping us all um, sane right now. Just um, so uh, I think I think it's really important that we have to maintain those systems um, for sure. So in that in that regard, I think it's really essential. Tim, did, did, I mean you're working very directly on on some kind of like critical healthcare facilities. Like, are there any 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 thoughts, any perception from maybe people around uh, around you or around the team that are just looking at construction differently because of that? Well, yeah. Initially, when they when they when uh, New York shut New York State, I'm saying shut down uh, most businesses or or uh, what's going on out there, they left the entire industry of construction as essential. And you know, uh, they later people started to complain and saying, you know, a new high rise condos isn't so much essential. Um, so they looked at it close and then they came out with guidelines uh, a week or two ago that that uh, de described what essential was. But mm -hmm. basically, I mean, if it's if it's infrastructure, anything that's going to keep um, life going uh, and I mean, just life in general, not uh, saving a life, uh, keep things going like like the power grid, like electricity, like shipping materials, trucking, obviously hospitals, fires, uh, police transportation things like that's got to keep going um but anything on the building side of construction if it's a threat to the public or it's a danger to the building that's something you can't leave a piece of steel half up and then walk away while it's short up things have to be finished mm -hmm. to, yeah. to make it safe if it's left there for a period of time so i think people are are in their houses in their apartments they have to be able to survive uh, and that involves again certain utilities and certain functions of food deliveries things like that and again it's just being able to go outside of your house you have to be safe if you do go down the street in a car mm. uh, that's that's a good segue to uh to tyler i mean once again at inspection services right now it's really about making sure that even as we're rushing uh, facilities forward uh like we're still meeting a certain standard and so uh what what's your point of view on on, on that essential aspect yeah no i think uh nathan and tim really hit it on the head um and then plus uh you know department of homeland security also came out with a memo 
Um, that was uh, March 19th, and it just really described what was critical, what's essential. Um, of course, um, you know, like I was mentioning earlier, the the facilities are also considering what they feel is essential. But you you look at just outside of healthcare, and you know, you look at your homes, and you need you know power there, you need plumbing there, you you have an issue where you know, your plumbing is backed up. You need to have um, somebody come out there and, and help you fix it. So, um, of course, keeping that sanitary, um, those sanitary methods and processes in place and somebody to come out there and help you with that is uh, is definitely essential. It's essential for, you know, the, the health care and the well-being of people. So um, I think as far as our inspection standpoint and um, maintaining that oversight and, and review as we do continuously every day is definitely needed keep the project moving forward and um you know like um, tim mentioned a lot about um working in operating facilities and, and we, we're really trying to stay out of the operating facilities you know um as, as much as possible but we have a lot of facilities that are continuing with the work so we're in there we're, we're doing the work we're we're ongoing we have some projects at 10 percent. we have some projects at 80 percent and we're continuing the um, services to keep the jobs going. So uh, especially, I just wanna to say too, that, um, you know, these spaces are needed, um, you know, and, and while they're looking for spaces that um, they can utilize in their operating facilities, they're also looking mm -hmm. to get occupancy from the jurisdiction just to get that extra space completed and, and then move new patients in. So it's very important. So I've a, I've actually have a follow-up question for you, uh, Tyler. Um, like how much of your work are you able to do remotely uh, versus on site? Like, or, I mean, cause Tim was mentioning that they're running skeleton crews in the, in the, in the trailers. Uh, Nathan, I think is mostly uh, still running on site in terms of the, the, the technicians and the, the, the craftsmen themselves. What, what about inspectors? Um, inspectors really, they've, they've got to be out there. They've got to be in the field. They've got to be in the hospitals. Um, they've got to be looking at the work, looking at the material being delivered. Um, you know, Tim mentioned, you know, the, the driving and the trucking industry and uh, also the manufacturers. Some of our manufacturers for drywall shut down for a period of time and then reopened. Um, you know, you do have that concern with workers and whether it's safe and whatnot. But um, it, and we've seen a, a downtick from that, too. Um, but inspection definitely needs to be there. We have a lot of support staff um, too that luckily that they can be remote and not necessarily have to be in the environment and work from home. So we're, mm -hmm. we're fortunate in that. And I feel like we're fortunate just to maintain working. A lot of, a lot of people are at home and quarantined and, and stuck in their house. And I feel that we're fortunate that we can provide service for people and then continue the work. And, and that means we're getting out of the house and, and going to the job site. Yeah, yeah. Um, question for Tim. Uh, like we're seeing, uh, basically we're, we're starting to get used to the situation a bit more. I think the, the, the guidelines in terms of what's essential are being clarified. I think the, the liability side is probably being clarified a little bit uh, as well. So who has the burden slash liability of letting uh, a worker enter a site uh, that may be sick and that may contaminate other? Uh, where does that burden fall? Is it on the owner? Is it on the on the foreman of the the, the specialty contractor? Is it on the GC? Uh, how are you guys thinking about liability right now? Well, that's going to be a good question for years to come. <coughs> Excuse me, but I'm not a lawyer. I mean, we try to cover our bases. We um, we do have thermal scanning at, at, at many sites. Um, the hospitals themselves, if if you're going into a hospital, most of them will do some sort of screening or thermal scanning. They'll at least take your temperature going in to see if you have a fever going in. We've we've tried to initiate that at, at all of our job sites at the very least, just to take people's temperature, say you have a fever. It could be anything, but go home. Um, when somebody doesn't feel well, we certainly send them home or a spouse or somebody in their house is sick. We we make them stay home and quarantine for a minimum of seven days if it's something other than coronavirus. Um, if it is that, obviously it goes that till a minimum of 14 to 15 days. Anybody that comes back that was sick um, to any degree gets a doctor's note before they return. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's 
you know, it's something we we've told people every year. I mean, every winter when it's flu season in New York, or certainly in the Northwest, where people get sick, you say, if you're sick, stay home. Um, but people don't do it. So now it's it's a much more conscious thing. It's uh, it's much more acceptable to just say, uh, I'm staying home, or <laughs> you're going home, etc. Et yeah. But now with with the antivirus thing, there is a uh, a requirement to get a doctor's note to come back. Okay, and so when you were talking about a uh, thermal scanning, if you have a worker that that is like has a light fever when they show up on site, it's a strict policy where they cannot enter the site and they have to go home. Yes. Okay. Well, I think that's the that's the good implementation that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Tyler, a quick question for you: uh, What does a small contractor uh, do when I mean a lot of contractors have actually, uh, as as Nathan was talking about, given their stocks of N95s to to healthcare workers, uh, and many of them are are running low on supply. What if what if code says that you have to have uh, a mask and they don't have one? Uh, what should they do? What do we do? Um, you know, if they're working in a healthcare um, facility, a lot of the um, the facilities are actually providing the masks. So they'll have masks. I, I actually went into a facility yesterday and I had my own mask and they said, no, we'd rather use our mask so that way we don't have any contaminants from outside. So here's a mask and, um, you know, we have gloves for you as well. So they gave us the gloves, masks, they do the screening, you fill out a questionnaire, uh, you take your temperature and they give you a sticker that says, you know, you've been screened and that you're you're safe to be in, to, in the facility. Because we actually work on not only um, what they call Oshpod 1 being general acute care. We work in a lot of skilled nursing facilities, which would be considered Oshpod 2. And the skilled nursing facilities, you have a lot of um, patients there that are elderly, um, sick, you know, they can't um, move by themselves. Um, so they need that, you know, extra protection. Um, and so going into those facilities, you definitely want to be safe. You want to follow their guidelines. And um, in some regards, too, we're, we're getting whatever we can due to you know, just a limited amount of, um, you know, safety PPE materials that we have. Um, some people are using bandanas. Some people are making their own stuff. Um, we're using whatever we can. Um, but especially when we go into operating hospitals, luckily with all the um, um, donations and everything else, uh, they're able to supply that. Um, so you, you use it as the least amount as possible. And of course, going into the facilities, the least amount as possible. But when you do go in there, you, you definitely want to abide by their their rules and, and what they have to provide for you. So um, that, I think that's the best way to, um, you know, achieve some kind of compliance um, to to get in there and be around these people because you're not just protecting yourself, you're protecting, you know, the mm -hmm. other people around you. Yeah, I think that's one of the, the most important thing is the, the mask protects others more than it does actually protect you. Um, right. Nathan, you were saying that that the Navy has adjusted its language to allow for makeshift, makeshift masks or something like that. Is that what you were talking about? Yeah, we got a, a letter um, from the Department of Defense, Department of the Navy today, uh, with guidance for cloth um, face coverings, um, with some direction, specific direction about how much the face needs to be covered. But basically, on all DOD facilities all personnel are required to have a cloth uh, face covering now. Okay, uh, which is, I think, uh, intelligent because like people need to protect themselves whether or not they get access to, uh, to a 95s or, or similar type of uh, materials. Um, one of the, one of the things is that, uh, uh, Tim, I know you're bullish on, on hope, I mean, optimist at least on, on, a, on, a, on a medium term, short term reopening on, on, of many sites. Uh, is a company like like Tishman investing in kind of like home setups to help uh, its its engineers uh, and its its project managers that are working from home just be more efficient or like were there any technology investments that were done uh, to to guarantee that even if part of the of the the management is working remote they're able to produce well? I think being a construction company, you're probably a step ahead of it in that with us we have a we have a main office as you know. You know, there's hundreds of thousands, a uh, hundred thousand people in ACOM, uh, and Tishman's mm -hmm. a part of it. And um, 
we're not at a remote uh, at a main office. We're always in remote offices and field offices, and our field offices have anybody from you know two or three guys to you know we've got 50 plus at at the Waldorf. So um, almost always you're working to some extent remotely, even though some of the remote offices are pretty big offices. So you're used to having a laptop and taking a laptop with you. And, and our guys have tablets that they walk around with now on, on the job site, off the job site. So we, we had that initial setup and we have the different softwares we use, the, the Microsoft Teams and the Zoom and, and things like that to connect with each other. Um, and the different software where like FieldWire where drawings are downloaded and shared and the photographs. So um, we do that a lot now. A lot of the architects we deal with are, are out of town. We did a NYU job, the architects in Philadelphia. So we're doing punch lists and it's using FieldWire and photographs. And mm -hmm. they didn't have to come to Phil from Philadelphia to New York twice a week. Yeah. All of a sudden yeah. do the simple punch list stuff they came from the more complicated things, but it saved a lot of time. So I think right off the bat, we were we were kind of a step ahead in that way. But as I said earlier, some of the technology, like a guy like me does it, it took some catching up to be able to use this kind of stuff and uh, be remote constantly. Um, you know, we're used to being in, standing around a table with a set of drawings and pointing at this and redlining that and, mm -hmm. and and doing things like that so that's taken a little bit of uh getting used to but but everybody's upping their game to um take advantage of the technology yeah i mean i think that's one of the silver lining right now is i think a, a lot of companies are stepping up on 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 the on the on the technology front to be able to do more uh remote or 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 uh, with with reduced crews on site um one one little uh economic questions uh i think many of you have heard about like the the PPP uh, loans that the government is preparing, those are basically small business loans to try to bridge the economy uh, until the recovery starts. Uh, are any of you taking advantage of this? I think that might be a question that's more relevant for uh, for Nathan or Tyler. Have you looked at it? Uh, any thoughts? Um, yeah, we've taken a look at it. Um, I've had some of my staff. Um, you know, check it out and, and start to fill out the information and, and really just in preparation of if we do have some slowdown. Um, currently right now, our, you know, everyone is, is fully staffed. I, I don't have an issue with that, um, but you definitely want to plan for the future because we don't know how long this is going to go on. So um, we, we have taken a look at it. Um, it's a lot of documentation to fill out, but mm -hmm. um, it, it's definitely on our back burner. Okay. Yeah, we're working on it as well. The same same uh, position here. We're filling out the paperwork and trying to get it in, and and we've got some questions. The banks are definitely overloaded trying to answer questions and and process the paperwork, and the SBA is going to be severely overloaded if they're not already processing it. So um, we're looking into it. We're not since we're still working. You know, it didn't. We're not too. Uh, anxious to get it in because we know a lot of people need it um, other than us who aren't working. So, you know, we've got, we've got some people at home that we're, you know, that we'd like to get compensated for if we can, but um, we're, we're just trying to feel our way through the process as, as smartly as possible. Yeah. I think we, we're having the same approach at, at, at Fieldwire. I think we're feeling the paperwork getting ready to trigger it if we, if we want to. Uh, I'm not sure that we have yet. We're really trying to figure out what we have to disclose and, and, and the details of it. Um, one uh, last uh, question that actually is a bit more long term. Uh, so we have like a like a, a student from a construction management program. Uh, like uh, many students, I think their uh, their graduation ceremony is probably already canceled at this point. The question is, are their internships going to be canceled as well? Um, and so, what what are you guys thinking about or, or or doing to to make sure that the next generation that's coming online? Uh, is able to actually start work somewhere uh, for an internship, uh, you know, when uh, when when June July comes. Um, for us, um, you know, we uh, we're going to continue on um, and, and keep moving forward. Um, you know, it's it's definitely a, a pandemic that we have out there, but um, you know, we we keep everybody's morale um, and, and really a lot is it. It's like, 
um, psychological for some people um, to keep them working and keep them moving forward. But um, we're going to continue with our edu education side. We're going to continue with um, trying to hire people and, and continue to work. Um, I think our industry and, and, and every industry will need that once we get past this um, this whole virus that's going around. So um, I, I, I employ all my people to keep looking for people that are interested and that want to work and and want to get out of that. And if we need to do some remote um, training, you know, we're, we're definitely set up for that. And, and that's how we're going to move forward with it. Yeah, same for us. I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a craft training instructor myself and uh, our craft training program is still operating. Uh, we're doing some did things a lot differently than we, than we did before right now, doing some correspondence and some online learning, distance learning, things like that. But uh, our apprentices are still still learning and, and still working. And so we're going to keep teaching them and, and moving forward as best we can until we can. Tim, what, what about the internship program at, at Tishman? Uh, as far as I know, we're, we're still going ahead with it. I've not heard any limits on it uh, or any anything that's going to change what we usually do. We usually have quite a number of interns over the summer, so I expect that it'll happen the same way this summer. Well, that's uh, I think like uh, that's probably the best uh, the best question to to end this thing on. Uh, and and I do agree like we're we're adjusting our interview process. We've hired our first employees without doing on site interviews, which is extremely weird uh, <laughs> to us. We have a very uh, in person culture, but I guess we're we're all adjusting. Um, yeah, I mean I think that's that's the best way to wrap it up. So I want to uh, thank the panelists for their time and for the great content they've brought to us today. Uh, I think these turned out like really good again. Uh, I want to thank the audience for dialing in. Uh, and finally, I want to thank the team for putting these together. It's a ton of work uh, to put those uh, those town halls together. Uh, and so uh, wish everyone a great Tuesday. And uh, bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Take care.